listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. Uh, we got some wonder or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my center light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want you know, going to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that it does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing a brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. Sasquatch Syndicate. I'm your host, Chuck, out in Seattle, Washington, along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at SasquatchSyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. So where do I begin? This is a very personal and difficult thing to podcast about, and I didn't want this episode to become a eulogy, but rather a celebration of my friend and mentor, Jim Fowler. But there's so much to the story. Perhaps this is the long epitaph of my relationship with Jim. Before I begin, I have to describe where I came from. I know many of you know I grew up in Nebraska in the 1970s. I went to school, which in those days we had daily drills of putting our heads under our desk, waiting for the imminent nuclear attack from Russia. Omaha was ground zero, strategic air command and visions of Red Dawn. While it was a fairly simple life, Dukes of Hazard on Thursdays, Battlestar Galactica on Friday, and on the weekend, we had visits to the family in Palmer, Nebraska, and sometimes, if we were lucky enough to make it home early on Sunday, my parents would watch their favorites, The Lawrence Welk Show and Hee Haw, while I escaped to sneak away in the other room, lay on shag carpet, and watch an old Zenith Council TV while watching Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. I was able to explore the world and go on a safari every Sunday. I even had this safari hat and vest. Even though I had taken camping trips to Canada, I was very young and I don't really recall them. At the time, the farthest I had remembered traveling was Table Rock Lake in Missouri and Bushels Lake in Arkansas. It was fairly normal until 1977, My mom took me to see Star Wars A New Hope. If you remember the scene of Luke Skywalker on Tatooine, looking at a binary sunset filmed in Tunisia, wondering what else the universe had to offer, well, that's the scene that changed me forever. After high school and college, I wanted to see the world, but back then, traveling was not what it is today. So the next best thing was to join a company that brought that to me. After a very brief stint at the Millard Packing Plant in Omaha, where I slung 100-pound racks of beef, and a short stint at Toys R Us, where I worked at the warehouse, I threw in the towel. Besides, I had an education in computer programming, audio-video production, and I was done with manual labor. But where do you take that in Omaha? So I threw my skills at one of the world's largest mass marketing production companies in the world, Watts Marketing of America. Now, back in the 80s, if you had a program and you needed to promote and sell it on TV, we were it. I started on the phones that year, moving into campaign management. I got into production marketing, publicity. I mean, you remember the guys with ties at the Jerry Lewis telethons? All the old Time Life books and video promotions on TV. I mean, this was the big leagues. After a couple years, my boss came by and said, Hey Chuck, would you be interested in handling a special project with NBC? Of course I said yes. A day later, he comes by, he hands me a binder, and on the front it says, Wildlife Project. I didn't really think much of it. He says, tomorrow you'll be meeting with a new project team. Do as you're told and listen. I said, thanks, and I was just hoping to get out of my cubicle. Like many of you, I began my career at the bottom rung of the ladder. I had done many odd jobs in production, but I had very little experience. 
and there were many kids like me on the same rung. But luckily, I was one of the bigger kids on set during productions, and I stood out as one of the editors said they liked my smile. Ultimately, I saw it as I was probably the one lucky enough to be picked to carry the recording equipment because I was the biggest. But that really didn't bother me. I had a strong back from football, hanging beef at the Millard Packing House, and heck, it came with a really cool vest. And I got to leave the office two to three times a week, go to the Henry Dorley Zoo, and film audio and video clips of animals. It was sort of like what you'd get on outlets like Pond 5 today. I was young. I was in my 20s. I got to drive the production van. And I was doing field work, which consisted of carrying not only one, but two Walkman cassette recorders, Velcro strapped to my belt, with a long boom extender and directional mics. But this was not your ordinary Walkman. I had the Walkman Professional Edition. This was state of the art. I also got to carry multiple JVC video cameras, which between the two of them weighed about 50 pounds each. If I only had an iPhone or a smartphone back then. <laughs> But there I was, and all that mattered was I was learning. I lived by two mottos. One, you always have to have something going on. And two, sometimes just show up, smile, and see what happens. You see, working in audio and video production was something very special in the 80s. You had to be excellent. I mean, this was real talent. One, you had to make sure you had a TDK cassette tape, and it had to be clean. Two, it better be labeled correctly, and you better have fresh batteries and a backup when filming. And three, both cassette tapes need to be rewound all the way to the beginning before you clicked record at the same time. And if you mastered that, you were well on your way. Not that the rules have changed all that much in terms of sequencing, but back then when you pushed the cassette tape button down, it didn't always stick, so you had to keep an eye on it. And this was not a joke. I mean, if you didn't do it right, You'd get written up in post-editing. Now imagine your boss writing you up because you're out of sync over 2 to 10 seconds. This costs a lot of money in the work stream to resync the two tapes. And if you didn't have a backup and an audio clip was missed or a mic turned the wrong way, let's just say the work environment may not have been as pleasant as it is today to deal with your boss. But you learn to be meticulous or else. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I nearly quit over the idiocracy of seeing the team being yelled at over such minor details, which was a daily occurrence. I was so paranoid I even used to practice on my brother-in-law's home JVC system at night. He had bought this state-of-the-art two-tape system in one where you could edit and splice. I must have made a hundred mixtapes and practiced everything I could. I probably even broke a couple of his buttons. But because of that, it improved my editing skills quite dramatically. I'd even work nights sometimes so I could edit, slice, and program when no one was around. It was much less stressful than being ankle bit while I was trying to do this all day at work. I did that for many years until I perfected it. And one day my boss came in and said, Hey, tomorrow, can you be in a suit? I need you to meet some folks for a new campaign. I figured, man, this must be another big insurance promotion in Omaha, so I'll have to figure out a plan to dress up. I went home. I didn't get my work done that day. Since I hadn't had a suit tailored since my early teens, and working in the packing plant didn't require a dress shirt, I grabbed the only shirt I had. It was about two inches too short. I rolled up the sleeves. I cuffed them. I grabbed my dad's black tie, a pair of black slacks, best shoes I had. And since I didn't have a suit coat, I reached in and I grabbed my dad's green goose down vest. It had an NRA patch right over the heart. To me, worst case, I looked like an NRA executive. And I figured, heck, it's Nebraska. So worst case, I'd come in and hang up the vest. I had a tie on. I was good to go. So I walked through the doors at Watts. This was out at 93rd and Bedford in Omaha. If you're from Omaha, you'll know where that is. I walked into the conference room, and here sits two executives from our company, my boss Cliff. And across from them is a mutual of Omaha executive, an editor, Bernard Bram, and oh my God, Jim Fowler, my hero from Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. As I come around the table, my boss Cliff is introducing me. I reach out to shake Jim's hand. Jim's looking directly at my dad's NRA patch, looks me directly in the eye, and he says, you weren't out there killing anything endangered, were you? I was so embarrassed. 
Here I was across from my childhood hero. To me, the greatest explorer in the history of the world. But my hero of animal advocacy and wildlife conservation. The man who took me on a safari every weekend. Thinks I'm a hunter. Out killing animals. He's worked his whole life to protect. And my dad's NRA badge is right in his face. So grasping the moment in Jim's hand, I leaned forward. I looked Jim directly in the eye. And I said, only the hottest two-legged deer in Omaha. We all laughed. And the rest was history. He was a good sport. Jim and I hit it off pretty well. Like my father, he was born in 1930. And every time Jim would come to town, we'd review the editing. I'd listen to him tell stories about his adventures in the Amazon. His work growing up in the swamps of Georgia. But he was a sharp contrast to my father in terms of his approach working with me. If you've ever been coached by your father, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's a lot easier to take criticism from your coach than it is your father. I'm not sure how else to explain that, but that was our relationship. He loved most of the work we did, and I would spend hours looking at film with him, what his vision was to deliver the message properly, what he wanted to change, and how he'd like to promote it and have it perceived on television. While NBC was in charge, Jim wanted to make sure that the work he and Marlon had done over the years was represented in the correct light. And when we, or them, wished to take liberties, Jim would often just say, don't you feel it would be better represented this way? Which ultimately meant Jim didn't like the angle. But Jim had a gentle way about him, and he had a way to influence people that really stuck with me. Now, I guess I shouldn't make any assumptions for the listeners at this point that they would even remember the show. But Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom was an NBC Sunday night family adventure. The show at the time featured St. Louis zookeeper Marlon Perkins, zoologist Jim Fowler, and later Peter Gross bringing the animal kingdom into the living rooms of America. The show influenced an entire generation. Everything from wildlife biologists, zoologists, researchers, and even birders. Jim Fowler was known for birds. As a matter of fact, the name Fowler means those who hunt birds. For many of you that know me, I love owls. Jim was the reason I loved owls. I've done many interviews over the years. I've talked to many folks, even in the Sasquatch community. The show Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom not only influenced myself, but over the years, People like Larry Batson, Les Stroud, and even birders like John Bendernagel. When I began my work with Mutual of Omaha and NBC, Marlon Perkins, who pioneered the show, had just passed, and Jim had taken the reins as a celebrity of sort. I should preface that by saying Jim hated that title. But Jim became America's most well-known zoologist and conservationist for not only his work on Wild Kingdom, but his appearance is on another Nebraska native show, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Yes, Johnny was from Norfolk, Nebraska. It was so nice to finally work with someone beloved by so many with no ego dimension. And perhaps it was the work he did and that he cared about it. He wasn't just a celebrity promoting something he didn't believe in. This was Jim's life. Jim was kind and he was nice to everyone. You couldn't be around Jim and not be nice. By the way, whenever I mention Marlon Perkins, people say, did you work with Marlon? And the answer is no. Marlon actually passed away in 1989. But I did visit his memorial. Marlon is actually buried at the Park Cemetery in Carthage, Missouri. And that's actually on the way from Omaha as you go down to Table Rock and Bull Shoals that I was talking about. Can't go down there without going down Highway 71 through Carthage. You'll get there. And if you ever have a family member into Precious Moments statues and they want to see the Precious Moments Chapel, which, by the way, is phenomenal, you'll want to stop in Carthage, Missouri. But while you're there, you'll also want to go see Marlon's Memorial. 
But back to Jim. Taking on the project of many of the older films shot in the early 80s, it was very difficult at the time. They all needed new intros, new introductions, and so we filmed on location at the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, and in the early 90s at the San Diego coast, as well as the San Diego Zoo. For those of you that recount the episode of Jim Fowler being ran over by sea lions, that would be my error. If you recall, I'm the largest person in the group. I'm responsible for two recorders with the record buttons pushed down, mics in the correct area, looking down at the recorders, Jim's walking on the beach, and sea lions are coming in in orders of one, pairs of two, groups of ten, groups of twenty, groups of twenty, groups of twenty. And while everybody's yelling, I'm still looking down. I step backwards, fall in the sand, and everybody running trips over me. It was a domino disaster. And in my opinion, one of the greatest bloopers in television history. With every take, there was never a dull moment. And maybe I should add to Stan Gordon saying that you can script a human, but you can't script an animal. But regardless of what happened, Jim just would say, let's try that again even once bleeding profusely from a talon that caught his ear. Now you can imagine being young, I made many mistakes, which when working through scripts and animals simultaneously can be rough. From recording a shot without the record button pushed, a mic aimed in the wrong way, and while the directors could be jerks, literally. Jim never gave me a hard time. And although at times he probably often wanted to, he was a kind man. He'd laugh. And this was a very important lesson. Jim always treated me with a smile and respect, even when I failed. And he would show compassion versus yelling at me, like many others. Jim would simply raise his eyebrows and say, You ready this time, Chuck? And give me a wink. But what he taught me is that you can achieve the same results with different approaches. And Jim's approach was to be nice. And I will always take Jim's approach and inspire to be like him. When folks let Jim down and they didn't uphold their agreements, Jim also just said, it's not worth my time to do business with you. Sometimes those folks would come around, other times they would not. But Jim always held his word. I respected that. Over the course of a couple decades, Jim appeared on over 100 appearances on The Tonight Show and really became a household name, bringing nature and the outdoors into the television homes of America. He even made a guest appearance on the Jerry Seinfeld episode where Kramer buys the Merv Griffin set and decides to have a skit called Scandals and Animals. It's one of my favorite episodes of all time. But ultimately, Jim's goal was to connect people with the natural world. But oftentimes, connecting people to that world involves the use of technology and promotional appearances to promote the causes we represent. And ultimately, he knew that. At one point, Jim told me, I spent many years in the Amazon studying and capturing harpy eagles, but if no one knows what I did or who they are, no one will ever care. So in some regards, we take the same approach with Sasquatch and this show and his legacy will live on through me. If nobody's aware of the phenomenon, it will never be solved. Connecting people to this mystery could one day inspire the next generation to carry the mantle and perhaps lead to one of the most important discoveries of our time. But we won't do it alone. Just like with Jim, we'll need your help to get off the couch. My son asked me recently, Hey Dad, which video games did you play growing up? I said, you know, when I was a kid, I liked to fish. And I was perfectly fine with that. And sadly, it seems we've lost sight of that. However, someday, perhaps an event will unfold that technology and all these distractions will be unavailable. And all we'll have is a walk. Or a fishing or a hike, and maybe we'll just enjoy being outside. 
But until then, we hope you try to maintain the best balance possible. And while I'm at it, I know many of you have written in asking if the show could be more frequent than once a month. But one thing I learned from Jim is it's important to maintain balance. So between programming, conferences, appearances, production, family time, and just getting out to do what I love, there's going to be gaps. And I do apologize. But I do inspire to be like Jim. And I do believe, in some ways, you should too. If I could make a wish for Jim, it would be to take time to be less hyper-connected. Maybe this weekend just take a walk. Maybe go out in nature. But do it without the headphones in your ears, drowning out what the natural world has to offer. And let me know how it goes. You may actually be surprised on what's available in the world around us. For those of us that were privileged to work and be inspired by Jim Fowler, we will never forget his passion in this regard. But you don't need to hear it from me. Let's hear it from Jim. Quality of life, uh, what role does that play? Uh, I don't see people discussing quality of life in the degree that it should be discussed. Is quality of life going to shopping malls and playing golf and going to movies and hanging around with the internet, or is it involved the natural world? Well, certainly in my case, it's involved the natural world a lot. If, if you could get out and go up a creek with your family and have a picnic, it's something that's incredibly important to people. Quality of life, yeah, how much does that depend upon open space, wildlife, and wilderness? I think it has a lot to do with our understanding of the planet, but it's a contact with reality that I think we have to sustain. But also, if we don't utilize uh, open space and wildlife and wilderness as part of our quality of life, we can get disconnected even more than we are right now. And the more disconnected we get from the natural world, the more in the future we're playing with uh, fire. Because if we don't respect the laws of nature, a lot of people that may not have much material wealth, but by golly, they love the outdoors. They can go fishing. They can do all these outdoor activities. And th thank goodness there, there are still plenty of activities available from hunting and fishing and camping bird watching. You know there are almost 15 million people in the United States that enjoy watching birds. Anything that justifies getting somebody in the outdoors and make it important to their lives, we need to, we need to promote that. Jim Fowler passed away on May 8th of 2019. He was 89 years of age. Jim Fowler is survived by his wife Betsy Fowler, two children Mark and Carrie, and two grandchildren. I will miss him. This concludes our June 2019 podcast. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Monday, July 1st. Thanks to all of our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us on social media. Sasquatch is a controversial subject. So for all the believers and disbelievers and those that will tell you they have all the answers, just remember, we're flying through space at 700 miles per hour. Buckle up.